noticing what's happening in this moment. Um, are you getting ready for something to happen? For us to all begin meditating together? Just being aware or reminding yourself that as long as you're sitting in front of the screen and it's the top of the hour or almost, then it really is an invitation to uh, be fully present. There's no show that's starting at the top of the hour. So how is it for you as you settle into this moment? Noticing, uh, bringing some degree of attention to the glide path into what you might think of as the meditation practice. Now I'm getting ready. Now I'm really here. Can you be here for the getting ready? For the transitioning from life to life? From life preparing for the top of the hour and then what are you preparing for? Here we are. So the meditation practice is really not separate from life itself. But there is an invitation when you take your seat to really take your seat, to really settle not just the body, although that's enormous, to just settle the body. And as the body settles, in some very real way, the invitation is for the mind to come along. And often the mind doesn't get the message, but over time, and especially if you're looking at a screen and you're seeing lots of people, or you know, you're know you just seeing me, but you have this some sense that it's okay to just drop right into now and no matter how agitated and perturbed and driven our thought processes are or what's on our minds, we don't have to erase or get rid of any of that. We just drop into a larger space in which that can be held and it's, it's just for now, a little eddy in the, in the current of the thought stream or of the vastness of your own awareness, embodied right here in how you take your seat. And even the word dignified or even any kind of... Uh, descriptor that we might add to it could possibly invite a certain kind of striving or idealizing. And please understand that that's not it at all. I'm just settling into sitting here, being here, lying here, however, wherever. It is for you right now. Having gone to all this trouble to free up this time to be available. Available for whom? 
So the invitation is make yourself 100% available. Inwardly, outwardly, beyond inwardly and outwardly. And simply be fully present with things as they are. Pleasant, unpleasant, or neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Just boring. <laughs> Noticing that too is a mind state that can be embraced. Rather than undermine your motivation. So reminding yourself and rebodying yourself in this moment around what your motivation is for being here, whether you've been here for 13 weeks or today's your first uh, visit. What is your motivation today, now? And can you uh, appreciate it and then simply drop? right into awareness, settle, rest, with no place to go, nothing to do, nothing to attain. Underneath thinking, in between thoughts, Rilke's rest between two notes. So letting go of everything that's come before, everything that's yet to come, and simply settling into this moment we call now.
as we rest here in awareness, how is it in the body right in this moment? And how is that known? I'm certainly not inviting you to think about it. or to build a story in response. Right in this instant, with awareness suffusing the body inwardly and outwardly, how is it in this moment? Underneath words, And is it possible to simply allow this whole domain of life expressing itself to be as it is, to be met and known and fully accepted in this timeless moment as it is? Again, underneath words, underneath stories, just this. And equally, I might invite you to take a look or take a, or feel your way into, or just glimpse, how is it in the heart, right in this moment? Agitated, peaceful. Optimistic fearful, and again, the invitation is to be the knowing that your awareness already is, and always has been, your entire life actually, but we've been ignoring it, it wasn't, hasn't been pointed out to us that it was a, a, a re, not just a resource, a universe, an inhabitable universe. So how is it in the heart, right in this moment? And how is it in the mind, right in this moment? The landscape of cognition, conceptualization, thinking, Is it possible to just recognize the landscape of the mind at this particular instant and allow it too to be exactly as it is? Why not, since it's already as it is? And again, be the knowing. It's the same knowing. Whatever door you privilege, body, heart, mind, it's the same door, In, or a different door, let's say, into the same room. Really, it's the same door, but the room is the room of awareness itself. Can you take up, or have you already taken up residency here in this moment? In such a way that over these past 13 weeks or 13 years or whatever your time frame is for practice, that uh, in this moment, Your wholeness knows itself, non-conceptually, that you're completely at home.
in the midst of the full catastrophe of the human condition, writ large, writ small, with everything that that entails right now on the planet and in your particular countries and cities and locations and families and bodies. Right now, resting in awareness Inhabiting awareness, taking up refuge, something we spoke about a lot in the early weeks, within awareness. And being the knowing that awareness is and always has been. And the knowing of not knowing. And this is a knowing with, without a knower, just the way there's breathing without a breather. Even though we say, I'm breathing, frankly, if it was up to whoever's claiming to be breathing to keep the breath going, you would have died a long time ago. Got a text, email, distraction, one kind or another. Whoops. Dead. So when we say my breathing, or even my body, it's really interesting to inquire who is actually claiming that. The fact of the matter is that biologically speaking, the brainstem and the phrenic nerve and the diaphragm, while we can hold our breath, they, they really don't allow us anywhere near the, the controls of the breath because they're so unreliable that we would become distracted and then forget. So the breath is doing us much more than we're doing the breath. And if the meditation practice has become, in some sense, a ferocious love affair for you and an expansive, beautiful love affair with the full dimensionality of the human, the possible then um, there truly is no place to go, nothing to do, no special something to attain because the whole universe, the constellation is insanely special, unique, beautiful, and at the same time, nothing special at all. And so as we practice, one might say, at least metaphorically, we're a long way from the data 
proving it completely that cultivating mindfulness in this way is shifting the default mode network in the brain to actually greater wakefulness, mindfulness, embodied presence, and less the mode of mindlessness, mind wandering, being perpetually out of touch or lost in thought. Not that that's not wonderful, mind wandering and the potential for creativity and, and who as a meditator hasn't noticed that the mind is wandering from time to time. But where there's the appreh the apprehending of the wandering mind, who is who is that? Who is apprehending? And that aspect of mind maybe has never wandered at all. So this is it. This moment, this breath, this sitting here, this being human. This being on the planet at this particular moment in time with all the centripetal forces that are in some sense challenging it, if not pulling it apart. So in the final moments of the sitting, can you simply let each in-breath be a new beginning? Each out-breath, complete letting be, letting go. No narrative. Just this. Just this. And again, if your eyes have been uh, closed, you're invited to uh, open them, but open them with such a degree of attention and mindfulness that there's no break or in the continuity of your awareness. Gazing at the screen, whatever it is that you're uh, looking at. Still full awareness of the body, heart, the mind, and the world. As you know, um, this is uh, our next to the last session, uh, although there'll be one on Tuesday, which will be more like a meeting. Um, although it can be a totally embodied, mindful meeting, I will not be there in any event. Um, so there's a certain glide path that we have through this whole week to tomorrow when we'll be 
closing out the mitigation retreat and in a sense uh, opening to the real retreat, which is life itself. So the end, the idea of endings and beginnings are um, all, all relative. And if this has been of any impact in your life for whatever reasons, given whatever your circumstances, uh, we could say, and I think I've said this before, not that I can keep in my mind what's gone on in every one of these sessions for 13 weeks, but the 13 weeks could be thought of as the kiss of the bells. So the bells, the impact in that moment, that's the 13 weeks, but the sound goes on. If instead of bells, I uh, used a flashlight and I just turned it on and turned it off, I maybe pointed it at the sky at night or during the day, the photons that would come out of the flashlight, they're out there forever. We've talked about colliding black holes and we've talked about the <clears throat> gravitation waves and the infinite boundlessness of space-time. So the light goes out infinitely. Let's think about that, at least metaphorically, as the potential for this retreat, that we've come together for a particular period of time, something that has arisen that is truly remarkable and really, in some sense, unknowable by the human mind, or only knowable to a degree, especially by the thinking mind. I notice for myself that already I feel so deeply connected to what has unfolded here and to all of your faces, at least the ones I can see on, uh, on Zoom, but can feel in YouTube, even though I can't see you. And in many cases, I know some of the people that are on YouTube. There's a sort of profound sense of uh, us having been together for something that uh, is immeasurable. And in fact, uh, in the Buddhist tradition, uh, loving kindness and compassion and empathic joy for the uh, experience of others and then equanimity, <coughs> those four qualities of heart or mind are called uh, the um, divine abodes or immeasurables. Heartfulness is immeasurable, compassion immeasurable, equanimity immeasurable, joy immeasurable. All of them are easily missed. Maybe kindness and compassion are not things that need to be cultivated, but uncovered, discovered, or recovered in the heart. <coughs> Same for joy. Even in the midst of sorrow, even in the face of the full catastrophe of the human condition. Same for equanimity, balance, those stabilizer fins on the submarine. Keep it from turning like a can. So um, part of the invitation is keep up the momentum of practice. All puns intended, okay? Momentum. So that six months from now or whatever, this doesn't become some kind of nice postcard, nice uh, memory of uh, our the COVID time where we all sheltered together and told each other stories. A lot like has happened in other pandemics, you know, where people get together and talk in that way, meet, are thrown together in a certain way.
Boccaccio's Decameron comes to mind, maybe even uh, the Canterbury Tales. Um, the tales of the Arabian Nights, who knows? But, you know, when we get together and we're telling tales, this is kind of anti-tales. This is a kind of, you know, touching the soap bubble of the narratives and finding some, I won't call it a thing, but some aspect of being that's been here all along that we have ignored uh, for too long, I would say. So the word mindfulness, for instance, in Chinese <coughs> is um, made up of two ideograms. The ideogram for now or presence, which is kind of like a hat. Um, and that's sitting over the ideogram for heart, which is uh, brush strokes that have four chambers, basically, you know, so mindfulness in Chinese is now heart. If you forget the heart dimension or separate compassion from mindfulness in your mind, you've just misunderstood what the invitation has been all along. So This is it. I mean, it's been it all along. The changing conditions, conditions are always changing. We spoke many times about causes and conditions and how easily it's, we get caught up in causes and conditions and then lose our minds when we absolutely, at the moment that we most need to find our minds or rely on our minds or inhabit our minds or call on our minds to access, not generate, but access that divine abode of compassion, that divine abode of equanimity, that divine abode of some degree of elan vital or joy or empathic joy for others, for all beings, right in this moment and not losing sight of that even in the dark moments or the dark times. It's all right here, right now. It's not like we're going to get any closer to enlightenment down the road, whatever that word might mean to you. We're just going to get older and then die. Hopefully not of COVID. So let's be careful. This, it's easy to think of oh, the mitigation retreat is ending. I hope it's not ending for us individually and personally, because how we attend to these kinds of things, as you can watch day by day by day in the United States, where all the European countries have flattened the curve. And it was horrific in Italy and Spain and and France and so many other places and flatten the curve in the United States, just way up there. I mean, with just death after death after death by now 120,000 and, you know, no end in sight because of the human mind in this, in my particular country at this moment, or the lack of leadership or whatever it takes so that we actually are not paying attention to what we need to be paying attention to, to do what all those European countries did. And we're not the only country that's has our head in the, in the dirt. And so we're seeing mindlessness, greed, hatred, and delusion, serious delusion played out in like unbelievable ways where the stakes are ex absolutely enormous. And for the least privileged in the world, the highest stakes. Because for all sorts of reasons that we've already gone into, we don't need to go into here. So 
No separation between mindfulness and, uh, and compassion. No separation between you and me. Um, now let's not get caught in the story of me or the personal pronouns and, and in performance and how good meditators we are or anything like that. And maybe, you know, and I've just throw this out there as kind of in the spirit of being provocative, maybe it's not skillful uh, to um, emphasize enlightened beings at all and project that onto certain people that way you then put on pedestals, even though they are always telling you <laughs> that's like in the case of the Dalai Lama, for instance, I'm uh, just a simple Buddhist monk. He is and he isn't. But when we project onto him or anybody else, enlightenment, it's, it's really a, a form of violence uh, and ignorance and um, harmful to the person that gets the projection as well as to everybody else. But what about if we just kind of re, you know, approached it in a slightly different way because what if what if um rather than thinking about enlightened people we thought about enlightening moments and then um we see where whether there are enlightening moments and in darkening moments and what the difference is between and in darkened moment for us, in the midst of trauma, grief, uh, threat, fear, and in enlightening moments where there's clarity, where there is equanimity, where there is calmness, where there is insight, and where there's generosity, where there's joy for others and the impulse which is Compassion is really a verb, the impulse to actually step in and carry part of the suffering. Even if it's impossible, the impulse is still there and the impulse can be felt. And that we are all in this together. We're all the cells of the one body politic. And the earth and the world and the human species and all the other species really depend on what this human species is going to engage in and whether we're actually going to wake up to the full dimensionality of it before, as I said, you know, the algorithms and uh, AI and uh, biotech combine as described by Yuval Noah Harari and create a world where homo sapiens are a thing of the past because we're so precocious that we can, you know, upgrade ourselves way beyond eyeglasses or hearing aids or crutches and maybe do it in utero or before conception. So the stakes are unbelievably high here as regards our lives in this moment from the pandemic to everything else. And by the way, the COVID-19, you know, is a very, very devious virus. And apparently it came out of bat caves in China. But, but you know, <coughs> these viruses, they're not even alive. They're just, they're just sequences of RNA. In the case of the SARS viruses, the RNA vi viruses wrapped up in a little lipid and protein and they mutate. So without terrifying ourselves, we need to recognize, a lot of people in my country don't even recognize that, they, they just say it's not even as bad as the flu, even though the death rate uh, is 10 times the mortality of the flu, usually, because that wasn't true in 1918. Okay, that was, so I'm just saying that this may not be the last pandemic. It certainly won't be the last pandemic. We better learn from this one. The next one could be 10 times as lethal. Don't forget that a quarter of Europe's population, maybe a third was wiped out by the bubonic plague. 
time for uh, the human species to wake up. So um, we're going to be here today for two hours, and I would like to really engage in uh, dialogue as we've been doing, because this will be the last time that we'll be engaging in dialogue. And when I say the last time, and the fact that it's ending tomorrow, doesn't mean that Soren's going to die, or John Bashan's going to die, and I'm going to die, and we're not going to care anymore about what's arisen, okay? We're not going anywhere. We're just extending ourselves into the next element of our own life unfolding in practice. And we'll see what happens, okay? No promises, but we'll see what happens. Uh, so before we go into the dialogue, I'd like to just, uh, if it's all right with you, I hesitate to do this, but I really, I, do you feel like the books that I've recommending are of any value to just kind of, not that you should read them all or read any of them, but um, if I could just get a sense of uh, thumbs ups or something like that, that if it, because I'm not really recommending books. What I'm recommending is glide paths into understanding different angles on reality uh, at this particular moment. But John, yesterday life. in okay. the chat, it was overwhelmingly positive. Okay, so let me just throw out some more and to just say as a proviso before I do it, we could be here for the next hundred years and I would never come to an end of what could be recommended. There's so much of a flowering of beauty in what has been made available in print. And that's before the internet or, you know, sort of, so it's not about the books, it's about how we come to taste uh, other people's imagination, creativity, insight, kindness in ways that resonate potentially with our karmic assignment of the moment so that we continue learning. One page of any of these books could change your life, one line. In fact, one of the books I'll recommend has something to do with the Diamond Sutra in the Chan Chinese, ancient Chan Zen tradition in China. And the Diamond Sutra, uh, the story goes, the sixth Zen patriarch Wei Neng in Tang, you know, dynasty China, was a kind of poor boy rice pounder in the kitchen who was just had a job working at this Zen monastery. <coughs> He's walking by the kitchen window one day and he hears one line from the Diamond Sutra. And it can just completely explodes his mind. And he's uneducated, he's never been to school. That line is, and, and somebody was just chanting it, and he happened to hear this one line, develop a mind that clings to nothing. Develop a mind that clings to nothing. Another translation might be, uh, develop a mind that abides nowhere, Ab abodes and abiding ha has been a theme through our 13 weeks here, abides nowhere, okay? Maybe a, a mind that abides nowhere abides everywhere. Everything is available because we're not, we don't precipitate onto glomping on to some kind of causes and conditions that catch us. So anyway, this rice pounder then winds up, and the story is absolutely marvelous, and there's competing poems between the head monk and, and this rice pounder about articulating in a few lines their understanding of dharma or wisdom. My Zen teacher used to say, open your mouth and you're wrong. But you have to open your mouth sometimes, and so this so I'm not going to go into any of that, except to say that um, one taste of this can change your whole life. And um, so let me just say a few. Th so the, the book that I was uh, had in mind is by a, a, a woman friend named uh, Byron Katie, who wrote a whole book 
uh, uh, about um, uh, based on the Diamond Sutra. She's married to Stephen Mitchell, who is uh, kind of uh, an old Dharma brother of mine and uh, a, a Zen practitioner. And so it's, and the title is uh, A Mind at Home with Itself. And it's an entirely different door into the Diamond Sutra because it's a kind of dialogue between her and her husband, Stephen, about her own experience of reality. But it might be fun uh, because it, it really is the Diamond Sutra in the new incarnation. Uh, another book, you can't see what this says and I can't know what it says anyway, but uh, this is called uh, the Recorded Sayings of Layman Pang. It's one of the earliest books that I ever read. And the Einstein quote from the New York Times, I put in this book in 1972 and it's still there. Apropos of the Einstein quote, which I, I think I got right the second time I had a run at it yesterday, but I couldn't quite remember what uh, Sir Arthur Eddington said after I brought it up. So my, you know, so much for the reliability of the thinking mind and memory at times. But I, I went back and looked at it and Sir Arthur Eddington was the person who uh, proved Einstein's uh, theory uh, of relativity by measuring, you know, during an eclipse of the sun in 1919, the sort of precession of the, of the orbit of, uh, of, of Mercury. Uh, near the sun. So um, he's, he was asked by a reporter in 1919 when they were engaged in this whole um, attempt to prove or disprove Einstein's theory. Uh, he was asked, uh, uh, he was asked by a reporter that the reporter had heard that there are only three people who understand uh, Einstein's theory. And Eddington is said to have replied, really? Who's the other one? Which I thought was really sweet. Anyway. Um, John, what was the one you just mentioned? People are asking the last one. The it's the called the uh, Recorded Sayings of Layman Pang. Layman Pang also lived in either the Tang or the Song Dynasty in China. And uh, they, he was a merchant and he lived with his wife and a, adult daughter. At a certain point, they took all their possessions and put them on a barge in the Yangtze River, I think, and uh, then sank the barge and then wandered around China for the rest of their lives, engaging people in dialogue about the nature of reality and mindfulness. And the dialogues in the book are absolutely you know, mind-blowingly wonderful, full of humor, completely orthogonal to any kind of contraction around linear understanding. And that's a very, very important part of mindfulness, not getting caught in mindfulness narratives. Hmm? So I'll just keep going in that regard. Um, my Dharma brother, Larry Rosenberg, wrote a book not that long ago called uh, Three Steps to Awakening. It's beautiful. Um, the subtitle is A Practice for Bringing Mindfulness to Life. Pun, play on words. Um, then a book by Matthew Ricard, uh, who many of you may know, called Why Meditate? Okay, uh, and in particular oriented towards how we deal with thoughts and emotions, which, you know, usually they feel like, well, I, I'd be having a great meditation if only it weren't for all these thoughts and emotions that are driving me insane all the time. So anything by Matthew Ricard would really be worth reading. Uh, he's also written a book, I don't have it here, uh, I have it elsewhere, uh, called Altruism, which is, is, I really recommend. I mean, it's just an incredibly powerful book. 
So those would be good books. And then um, a book called What is Zen? If you're interested in the Zen door by uh, Norman Fisher and Susan Moon. Um, absolutely priceless. Subtitle is Plain Talk for a Beginner's Mind because he's in the tradition of uh, Suzuki Roshi and the San Francisco Zen Center. In fact, Norman was the abbot for many, many years of the San Francisco Zen Center and uh, Tassajara Zen Monastery. And uh, Suzuki Roshi book, Roshi's book is titled Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. I gave that to you uh, a few days ago. So plain talk for a beginner's mind. Then I want to say a few things about um, embodiment. Okay. This is really hard to talk about. Like, what, do you, what is even the biology of embodiment? This was something Francisco Varela was really into. And Francisco Varela, along with uh, his good friends, uh, Evan Thompson and Eleanor Roche, a long time ago in the late 90s, came out with a book by MIT Press called The Embodied Mind. I've read this book about 16 times. It's highly underlined. I probably understand 1% of it. But some of you out there might really benefit from reading even here and there in a book like this. It's extremely powerful, extremely provocative, and links the practice of mindfulness to cognitive uh, science and uh, phenomenology in ways that are, pardon the pun, phenomenal. I mean, really phenomenal. And then the book was uh, revised and uh, reprinted by MIT Press in, I think, 2016. And here's another book that I just saw recently and, and read by a fellow named Scott Grafton, who's a neurologist, called physical intelligence. And we've been emphasizing that there's emotional intelligence, there's social intelligence, there's global, you know, sort of um, environmental intelligence. Uh, well, there's also physical intelligence, the wisdom of the body. I feel very badly that we haven't been able to get down on the floor and do yoga together or to do standing meditation or to do movement. I really feel badly about that. This format just doesn't allow us to do this. This book is really, really interesting. It blew my mind to read it. And it talks about something that technically they call affordances. It's like how the body actually knows where it is and isn't falling down all the time. Or if you're walking across a stream on rocks, the feet know how to do that. If you try to get your mind too involved in it, you'll lose your footing. So it's a very, very beautiful high level, he's also a neuroscientist, so it's just high level stuff, but he's also a yoga practitioner and a backpacker, and half the book is about being out there in the wilderness, in, in the high Sierras in California, and figuring out how to not die in the process. And the body, you know, that's how we all were like 10,000 years ago, before agriculture, when we were hunters and gatherers, like, Let's see, a few more on the meditation score. Um, Sansanim's original book, written actually with Stephen Mitchell, um, Byron Katie's husband, but not back in this day. This was like in the early 70s, I think, or mid 70s. Dropping Ashes on the Buddha, the teachings of Zen master Sung San, compiled and edited by Stephen Mitchell. It's mostly letters from his students and then his responses to the letters. Again, it will give you an orthogonal door into a lot of the uh, practices that we've been working with here, at least in spirit. And then, um, yeah, he also, his last book is called actually, Wanting Enlightenment is a Big Mistake. He talked a lot like that. Uh, Wanting Enlightenment is a Big Mistake teachings of Zen master Sung San. Then I want to come to the most important, I would say, teacher of the moment, Greta Thornburg. Okay, very little book called No One is Too Small 
to make a difference. She's already demonstrated that in spades. And I want to loop us back to uh, mindfulness of uh, global warming, the pending potential collapse of ecosystems, the enormity of the cost. That'll be one hell of a pandemic. And it already is in certain parts of the world that don't get anywhere near the attention that they need to get. Here's a book by my colleague and friend, uh, Biku Analio, who uh, is now in residence at the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies. And this is uh, a stupa at the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies. It's just built with rocks from the New England fields in Barry, Massachusetts, mindfully facing climate change. And he relates this to Buddhist texts and just is a living example of how the the ancient Dharma and what he, he's known for since he speaks Chinese, he knows Chinese and, and Sanskrit and, uh, and uh, Pali and some Tibetan and of course English and he's German and he knows a whole bunch of other languages as well. But he actually is really at the interface of translating a lot of ancient wisdom from the very earliest Buddhist sutras and teachings into exactly what we may need at this moment to wake up. Mindfulness, heartfulness, wisdom, but applied to climate change. And then lastly, Paul Hawkins' remarkable book that's really a collaboration of a whole lot of young people mostly called uh, Drawdown, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. And Paul Hawkins edited it, but there's a whole team of people that have been working on this thing. It's mind blowing, it's humbling, it's powerful. So I've now given you enough stuff to do for the rest of your life. Uh, please don't take it all too seriously. They're, they're just, uh, pointers, you know, just kind of meant to be a little bit like if something touches you in a certain way, the title or the cover or whatever it is, follow the lead, trust that it's not in the book, it's in you, but you're, you know, we're learning from each other because of all the reflectivity of all the diamonds in Indra's net. And you are one of those diamonds and you have multiple facets. So there's a multiplicity and a unity all woven into one, which, which uh, I, I, I truly love. So that's it as far as I'm concerned. Um, oh, no, that's not it as far as I'm concerned. I also want to mention two books by, uh, by friends of mine uh, who are um, Ralph Steele, for instance, who's African-American, grew up in South Carolina on the uh, Outer Islands, who I met 35 years ago when he came and visited one of the, my first MBSR classes. Uh, and he was a helicopter door gunner in Vietnam. Okay, so uh, a Vietnam vet into mindfulness, into meditation. He later became a monk and later uh, and moved to uh, Thailand where he practiced um, and uh, wrote this book called Tending the Fire Through War and the Path of Meditation. Highly recommend it. Uh, it, it he's just a, a beautiful soul. And as we've spoken about very often because of the way that the society is, uh, people often don't get recognized for the cutting edge um, gifts that they give to the world based on their own uh, life trajectories. And uh, the other one is by my friend and colleague who we worked together at UMass for many, many years in the inner city clinic and in a prison project that went on for four years that George uh, was the director of the mindful athlete, 
Okay, secrets uh, to pure performance. So again, it's another door in. Some people might be interested in going in the climate door, but some people might be interested in like, if you wanna change society, I mean, who are the heroes in our society? You know, people like, uh, uh, like uh, Michael Jordan meditated. Uh, people like um, uh, uh, LeBron James meditates. Steph Curry meditates. You may not recognize these people if you're not Americans, but they're like world champion um, uh, NBA players, National Basketball Association players. Um, and um, George trained these championship teams, the Chicago Bulls and the Los Angeles Lakers in their championship years. So there's a lot of interesting stuff in there about how you take the wisdom that we've been cultivating and actually bring it into various aspects of performance, not just sports, but life performance of any kind. So that's it, as far as I'm concerned, not just for now, uh, but for good. Uh, I won't be recommending any books at all tomorrow unless some book falls on my head that I just can't avoid recommending. Um, but again, please think of this as kind of love affair, not homework assignment, or, oh my God, I'm back in high school or back in college, and now I have a summer reading list. Please don't go anywhere near those kinds of thoughts, but just let them be, every single one of them, a new possible door into your own heart, your own wisdom, your own embodied presence, and, provide a certain kind of nourishment. It's a certain kind of food that could be ingested and metabolized that will simply grow who you really are in the sense of us continually from life to death. Hopefully, if we're practicing learning, growing, healing, and transforming, not just as me, myself, but as we humans. That's it. So John, should we open it up for a community uh, sharings or where you, how do you feel now? I think we should just open it up to community sharings the way you usually frame it um, and see what emerges. Uh, wonderful. So if you have a question, comment, reflection, you can um, click participants and at the bottom there's a, a option to raise your hand. And sorry, we can't get to everybody, but we will do our best. Um, and again, know that if you raise your hand, we'll bring your video up. Your video will be seen on Zoom and also on YouTube and it will stay on YouTube so other people can see it. So know that um, it's both visible here and on the internet. Uh, and I'm seeing Nadia. Nadia. I just spotlighted your video. It looks like you're unmuted. Sorry, sorry for the surprise. Let's see, I think <laughs> you're good now. Yeah, can you hear me? We can. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you, John, both Johns and Soren for this space. Yeah, it has been very um, helpful uh, for me. And uh, thank you to everyone who has shared something, uh, questions and experiences. I'm from Mexico and I have a question um, related with uh, attention, awareness <coughs> and consciousness. Um, uh, and I would like to ask you, John, if you can comment a little bit more about the relation attention, awareness, and consciousness have? Well, uh, I'm not really the person to answer that question because you know there's a huge amount of scientific debate and inquiry about what the hell those words mean. Uh, I, I would recommend uh, my dear friend and colleague, uh, Amishi Ja, who's just, you can find her on YouTube, an incredible uh, teacher uh, who talks a lot about the relationship of attention 
to awareness and mindfulness. Um, Chris, Christopher uh, Koch uh, is another neuroscientist who's the, the head of the, um, uh, the Paul Allen Institute in Seattle who writes a lot about this kind of stuff. And I think at the moment, nobody really knows how to differentiate whatever we mean by awareness mm -hmm. from whatever we mean by consciousness, okay? Oh, okay? So this is a place where, you know, and you can read a lot about this in that book, The Embodied Mind by Francisco Varela and his colleagues, but this is a kind of very, very interesting place to explore uh, but you can get very easily lost in that universe mm -hmm. in your own thinking. So uh, unless you kind of have very real reasons to pursue that kind of thing, uh, I would suggest that you ask yourself those questions rather than try to find out what the, 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 the top scientists have to say about it at the moment, because as I said, weeks ago, I think, for the first time, when we drop into awareness, it emphasizes the capacity that we're born with called sentience. In other words, that we are aware that we actually, and nobody knows whether you want to call it consciousness or awareness, nobody knows how you get that from trillions of uh, of, of neuronal connections and billions of, of neurons. Nobody really knows how you go from cells and physicality to awareness, which doesn't seem to have a physical element to it. It's, it transcends the material. And of course the Buddhists have been you know, very articulated about this from an, a lot of other angles, emphasizing the primacy of awareness or consciousness, and that everything stems from consciousness rather than everything stems from matter. You know, so a lot of people think, well, consciousness evolved as brains got more and more complicated, complex. Mm -hmm. And um, Sir Francis Crick, who won the Nobel Prize for the double helix uh, of DNA with Jim Watson. Uh, he, he wrote a book called The Astonishing Hypothesis in which it basically talked that all of this consciousness and sentience, it, it just comes out of neurons and it's kind of an epiphenomenon, whatever that means. So I'm not sure I can answer your question any more than that, but I, let me ask you a question in return. Who wants to know? Well, I asked that question myself, but um, and why? I think I'm I'm trying to make sense uh, of um yeah probably uh, in concepts and intellectually, intellectual. Um, but it uh, when I meditate, I can see how my attention and probably awareness can uh, like focus or contract. Yeah. and also help can expand. And so in that point, I get a little bit confused, maybe because I'm trying to make sense. Uh, and so I think, oh, attention probably is, is just the ability or the key I have uh, to get in touch with awareness. So when I'm in awareness, probably is the key to touch consciousness. I don't know. And, and at that point, I get really confused. Like, um, I can feel or I can sense that. Uh, I, I don't know how to explain or put in words. Keep going. But, You're um, doing yes. beautifully. Yes. So, uh, but I think I, uh, I guess I'm trying to make sense uh, to understand in words uh, what I'm feeling or what I'm uh, experiencing in that moment. Uh, yeah, because um, it seems like if you uh, pay attention to certain certain things, it's what uh, you will experience, right? Because I can 
pay attention to my body so I can feel sensations, but also I can pay attention to my feelings or uh, I can be aware of my thoughts. And, but that experience in the moment, and as you said, probably is not so important the object of attention, but the awareness that comes and accompany, accompany the, uh, uh, that is awareness. Yeah. Yeah. Accompanies, yeah. Uh, what's, your, what's your work? Oh, uh, um, I studied administration with emphasis in human resources. Mm -hmm. But uh, three years ago, I had the opportunity to, to go to Canada because my husband was studying a PhD. So um, in Canada, I had the opportunity to take the MB, MBSR program and also to begin a yoga practice. So mm -hmm. yoga practice <coughs> broke me to, 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 uh, to uh, the MBSR program. And I am um, getting training in the program. I'm teaching, I've just had teaching five groups. And when I'm guiding the meditations, uh, yeah, that's what I, maybe that's what I'm trying to, to, to make sense uh, but, uh, with yeah. words, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's very beautiful. And I can really feel your energy and, and uh, interest and it's right on target. Um, the fact that the matter is we know very, very little about what um, an experience is, any experience. We do not know how experience emerges. And all sorts of philosophers will talk about this from the point of view of how do you know you're not a zombie, you know? You know, that's some, that's some, it all looks from the outside like there's somebody in there, but there's nobody in there. Uh, so, because there's no experience, mm -hmm. like a machine doesn't have an experience, at least not yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although uh, it can feign, you know, it can pretend or may be made to look like it does, you know, people can sort mm -hmm. of have emotional experiences in relationship to like pet robot dogs and stuff like that. So, um, mm -hmm. I think the most important thing is do as much reading as you like. That will, and looking on the internet, definitely check out Amishi Jha and a whole bunch of other neuroscientists that love to talk about this stuff, uh, including okay. Judd Brewer, whose book I recommended some time ago, because they're looking with very creative technologies at what goes on when you get out of your own way, when you stop the internal narrative, or you don't stop it, it just drops away because you're not trying mm -hmm. to get anywhere else then all of a sudden the activity in various regions of the brain really changes. And so uh, Amishi is just a marvelous teacher. And I think, okay. uh, and she also studies MBSR. So, and she's at the University of Miami, which they sometimes call Mindfulness U. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I would check her out, A-M-I-S-H-I, -I, and then J-H-A. And it's a good place to start. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so much. Claudia. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Myla, uh, let's see. Uh, Myla, are you there? I don't see. So we'll go to uh, Narian. Hey, Narayan, good to see you. I'm asking you to unmute. Cool. Okay, perfect. Yes, I think I'm unmuted. I'm, uh, I think yeah, we can hear you. It's slightly okay, dark. Great. Um, it's where slightly are you calling from? We can still see um, you. I'm actually, um, I'm just over the border um, from Switzerland, um, not far from Geneva in, um, in France, actually. So near Mont Blanc. I don't know if you know Mont Blanc. Who doesn't know Mont Blanc? <laughs> I can just see myself on the screen, but it doesn't matter. Um, I'm not sure I have uh, like a perfectly formed question, but I just felt a kind of impulse to raise my hand. And um, yeah, 
I've really appreciated the um, the poetry for sure. I'm coming from Ireland, so John O'Donohue and um, Yeats poetry. Maybe I don't know if this is a like perfectly articulated question, but I'm just thinking of that experience, you know, of how a poem kind of comes into being. So you know, there's something like there's no form, and then the poem. And I'm just thinking about um, making the connection between that and maybe a strange connection, but what's going on at the moment, um, I recently read that maybe 380 million people uh, around the world will, um, will fall into like very serious poverty with all this COVID stuff. So I'm just thinking about, and I, this is a general question, but and um, what, would, what would a more compassionate kind of global world look like? And I know that's a very general question, but I guess the reason I'm asking you <clears throat> as well is just because at that intersection of science and mindfulness, and I'm guessing that to make the journey from, from, from like mindfulness being something practiced in Buddhism and having a particular form to even, I guess, being this MBSR, being something more scientific, it must have been some almost like, you know, uh, like a new form. So I'm just curious. I, I'm just just thoughts that I was thinking as you were talking um, on that on this subject. Well, you raised a lot of very interesting and provocative points. Um, not sure exactly what to say in response except that um, the poets do a certain kind of interior work, especially the great poets, in the same way uh, that the meditators are, you know, we're going beyond words. We're, look, we're dropping underneath thought and apprehending whatever it is that we're apprehending. And when that gets put back into words by really, you know, people like Yeats or... Um, John O'Donohue, it, it resonates so deeply in the heart of other people, especially if they hear it, as opposed to just read it, but even reading it, that um, it kind of uh, transmits something that's very hard to do with prose. So it's got a certain kind of embodiment to it. Uh, other than that, I'm not sure where to sort of, uh, ha you know, sort of come into uh, what you're asking because it is so kind of vague in a certain way. But let me just say yeah. that, you know, what I've said many times before that it's really trustworthy to listen to th the, the, the feelings, I won't even say questions, but the intuition that there's something here that's really important in terms of what is to come, like, or what the reality is now and what the world will look like if it were more mindful. We're participating in that. And I think it's really important not to idealize it, but to see it in the most microscopic levels in which we treat each other, in which we care for each other, in which we um, attend to what most needs attending. And to, to sort of point you in a certain direction, I haven't recommended this book, but there's a book out there called Factfulness by, um, I don't remember his name right off the top of my head, but a, 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 a Swedish uh, epidemiologist uh, and then his children, I think, brought it out after he died, but where on every measure of human well-being over the past 200 years, those measures have only gotten better, including, you know, the education of girls in, in societies where girls used to never be educated on every level, including levels of violence and so forth. Uh, so the book is called Factfulness, and um, I have it behind me, and also... Um, uh, there's a book called um, um, Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker, who uh, was originally a linguist and philosopher and professor at Harvard. 
And he's also making the case that if you look at the data, and he has about violence, about warfare, about disease, about everything else, that all of the indicators are that we're moving in the direction of greater well-being. But, you know, one nuclear accident or one pandemic that we don't treat appropriately, that's 10 times what COVID is, and all of those data points for the past 200 years would be wiped out. So we're at a really fecund moment on the planet, and uh, we need each other, and we need to help each other to envisage what it would be like to actually be real with each other, not by falling into utopia, uh, utopian views, but actually by grounding it in, in real life, measurable public health in the deepest of ways, um, uh, public health um, indicators. And just to say, MBSR, when I started it in 1979, was meant to be a public health intervention. It was not meant to be a therapy for people at all, medical or psychological or otherwise. It was meant to move the bell curve of the entire world, making medicine a kind of test case where if we could take thousands of people who are falling through the cracks of the healthcare system and invite them to do something for themselves that no one else on the planet could do for them through these practices of cultivating mindfulness in various ways, then uh, that itself would transform medicine, transform healthcare, transform uh, our capacity for living life as if it really mattered and thus transform the world. Okay, so, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Narayan. I'm just gonna- I think it's a little bit dark where I am, so- Yeah, maybe, yeah, we can hardly I, see you at all. You can't really see my expression. But so, we see the window I was smiling right over your yeah. shoulder. All right. Uh, yeah. we'll take, okay. Is is Mila still there in Russia? Mila, are you I, with us? I see a move movement there. Let's see. She's not on camera. She just disappeared oh, again. Oh, there, she is. oh, there she is. Do you want to ask something? Mila, Mila, Mila. Hello. Let's see. I believe I'm asking you to unmute. There we go. Can you try speaking? Yes. <laughs> Hello. Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Hello from Russia. <laughs> Where are you in Russia? Um, near Moscow. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I want to ask a question about fear of uh, social connection. You talk more about uh, connection that we need each other, but through the whole of my life, I feel that then I'm with nature, with my son, I feel deep connection. I feel the rain, I feel the snow, I feel the grass, and uh, I feel energy and that I'm the whole. But then I saw people, then I try to talk with them. I feel like I'm very, very small. Like I want to be even smaller. And uh, you mean, are you saying that you feel a disconnection? Is that what you said? Not disconnection, but fear. Fear, fear of other people, of, yes, the strong fear. So I, I prefer not to talk to, to other people and uh, just go away. Just go so, away. <laughs> yes. And uh, for me, it was not a big deal uh, through 20 years now. But now I have a son and uh, I understand that I need to give him opportunity to, uh, to connect with other people. 
people, not yeah. fear them. And how I tried. He? How old is he? Uh, four years, four years and a half. I spent with him 24 hours every day, and uh, um, every second for me is a pressure. And I tried Did you say to... pressure? Every second for you is a pressure? Yes. Precious. Precious. Oh, precious. 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 Okay. Yes. I <laughs> want to make sure I'm hearing you. That's a big difference. Precious. Yes. Wonderful. Precious. Yeah, I, I get that. Like justice. And every second justice. But I, I tried to use mindfulness to force myself not to fear other people and connection with them. But mm -hmm. I don't know how to do it. Because every time anyone asks me to, to talk, to play together, or to share my telephone number, I just say no. And I can't do anything else. I Is that because why. of the pandemic? Not because of pandemic. It was just the whole my life. I was close enough because my father was military and uh, I need to think about every word I say. And uh, I don't speak a lot with... With, with friends, I have a few of them. And now I, I listen only to you. <laughs> How long have you been uh, joining us for these? Uh, from the, from the first time. Um, really? So you've been here for 13 weeks? Yes. That's really beautiful. Uh, well, uh, you know, you may not be relating to your neighbors, but you're relating to thousands of people uh, in this community. And I'm very glad you got the microphone, Mila, because just to be able to say that you feel isolated and fearful is really important. And to let it be heard by other people, because... You know, th there's another aspect of you that I'm sure, like your awareness and your willingness to even talk about it in that way, that um, maybe is lonely or wants to connect or is not afraid, but um, you've fallen into certain habits, maybe because of your father and, you know, <laughs> whatever goes on in Russia around the military, uh, I wouldn't know, but... Uh, you know, but maybe this 13 weeks is in some sense a, a, a new beginning and a new invitation for you to maybe through your son, once the pandemic is over or whatever has gone on in Russia, again, I don't know where you're at with this whole thing, but from what I read, the pandemic's getting worse in Russia the same way it's getting worse in the United States. So you know, the fact that you've got your son and you have that deep connection with him and every moment is precious, over time that might unfold so that every moment of your life is precious, not just with your son, but with nature, with the air, with the sky, with, with life itself, uh, with friends, if you have friends. And over time, you know, maybe grow into uh, the new world that we're all having to grow into anyway. So whatever you were in the past, you can, you can throw it out and start over in your own mind and let the fear become just another object of your attention, but not something that's going to uh, prevent you from reaching out because your awareness of it, and I'll, this is what I'll ask you now, is your awareness of your fear frightened? Have you ever looked at that? And do you think that this connection that we have is real? Between you and me or between all of us? Between all of us, between you and me. 
what do you mean by real? It's as real as anything else, unless you're a zombie, <laughs> unless you're just a computer generated image of somebody who says they're in Russia, but maybe you're in uh, New York City. I don't know. So from that point of view, it's like, if you're asking me, and I'm not kidding around, yeah, I think we're talking, this is really real. This is as real as if I was, you know, seeing you in Moscow or wherever I might encounter you if the world were different. This is no kidding around. This is real. <clears throat> as real as anything. And a real opportunity to trust why you've been part of this community for 13 weeks in the first place. And I couldn't possibly tell you that, but I can admire it and intuit that there's something there that goes way beyond fear, a certain form of intelligence and love that isn't, you know, sort of going to be limited simply by your, you know, being a mother. So good luck. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And uh, <coughs> maybe we'll have another conversation in a year or two from now and see how things are. Thank you. Okay, be well. Thank you, Myla. Bye. And again, I'm just uh, looking through and I see Andrea. I cannot pronounce your last name, Andrea, but uh, you are here. Let's see. It says I'm asking you to unmute. Oh, I think you're good. You gonna try talking? Hi. You're good. All right, welcome. Oh, wow. Thank uh, you. Sorry, sorry for the surprise. Um, no, it's okay. Where you um, come from and question, comment, uh, reflection, thoughts, anything you want to share, you're welcome. I'm calling from Buenos Aires, Argentina. And um, well, to be honest, I'm not the kind of person who would raise her hand in the, in the middle of the crowd. So for me, it's, this exercise is also challenging. Like I have been shaking from the moment I, I, I raised my hand. Um, so, but I... <laughs> I kind of, I did the exercise to put the welcome mat to my fears and say, okay, thank you for worrying about me, but I will be fine. Um, it, but the thing is that for me, it was really important to kind of share how grateful I am that um, you have been accompanying me through all this time. I have been home alone for more than uh, 100 days and I, I don't know, I lost the count already. And uh, I, I, I was very lucky to find you since the very beginning. And, uh, and I don't know, day one, I, I, I don't know, my heart was totally broken by then. I had been going through a lot of experiences and this was actually uh, a great opportunity to kind of, you know what? Uh, accepting the invitation that you gave us to welcome that girl and uh, and give them, you know, give her some 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 wine and bread, uh, if you know what I mean. I know exactly um, what you mean. <laughs> give wine, give bread, give back your heart to yourself. So for me, this time was the opportunity to do that, and I'm I'm very very grateful. Um, you, Sorry, and John, and everybody else that make this possible. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm also here, but because I, I have like a crazy wish, I could, uh, I could actually have like a virtual hack, like all of us, before we say like, a temporary goodbye, at least from the from the experience as we live it now. So I don't know if you're open to kind of do that exercise. Like I haven't given a hack for I don't know more than three months, and yeah. I know that for some cultures it's not even an issue. It's not a thing, but well, in Latin culture, it's, uh, it's <laughs> Latin culture, it's a big thing, and um, you know, being alone. For, for that long, I, I'm so happy that you found us at the beginning. 
because we've been emphasizing, you know, that, I mean, that doesn't necessarily make it any easier in some ways. When you're alone, you're alone. You can't have hugs, at least real hugs. But a virtual hug, if that's what you're asking for, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're, all of us are going to just hug you right now, okay? Can um, you feel it? Yes, of course. Yeah, I, we're going to hug you so right much. here, yeah. right now, not waiting, okay? <laughs> so I invite anybody who wants to to reach out and just give Andrea a big hug. <laughs> uh, well, let's just dedicate it to anybody in the world who needs it. Well, that. there you go. I mean, that's showing <laughs> us who you really are, that you want to dedicate the hug to something bigger than yourself. I'm not worried about you. <laughs> <laughs> not one bit because of what you just said and just how you are. So, anything else? Just thank you. And um, let me tell you, I was in that. Buenos Aires the other day, I mean, <laughs> on Zoom, but there is a whole group centered in Buenos Aires who is doing exactly what we're doing. Do you know about them? Uh, not yet, but I will make sure to get in touch with them. Yeah. Yeah. I, if you put in, the name's Maria Noel. I don't know, I, I can't look for her last name, but Maria Noel, MBSR, and um, I mean, and uh, Daily Meditations or something like that. I think you'll find them. They are oh, mind blowing. You. And it's as big as this community and it's all over the Spanish speaking world. And they're meditating with a whole bunch of different teachers, but it's just like this. Wow. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you so much for being part of my path. Well, you're welcome. And, you know, you. I mean, I'm sure that there are a lot of people who have not been able to, you know, raise their hands and get called on who are have been isolating alone, you know, uh, in this uh, pandemic uh, for a long, long time now. And we do need hugs. We do need human connection. We do need, I think, I would say even eye contact that's not through cameras on our laptops. Uh, and we're doing the best we can. But what emerges out of this, hopefully, will be a kind of friendship and community that will go on for the rest of our lives and maybe for many generations to come. Uh, and an intersection between, say, whatever that community is that's doing this in the Spanish speaking world and every day. And they've been at it for 90 days so far. And, uh, and whatever's going on here and whatever's going on with all the, the great meditation teachers that I have not mentioned and I'm not going to mention who are out there putting out Dharma wisdom in ways that are truly wonderful. And they're all different doors as I've been saying, into the same room. And the real thing is to just come in the door. Don't stand in the doorway, as the great yogi Bob Dylan said. <laughs> it doesn't matter which door you enter. The important thing is enter. Thank you. That Thank you for really... being here. Thank you. Be well. You too. Good luck in all ways. <laughs> Um, so next I'm seeing James. There's actually a couple of James, but I'm seeing James uh, Romo. James, you are spotlighted. And thank you so much, Soren. Uh, um, sorry for the surprise, but welcome. <laughs> I'm so excited. I've been, um, I've actually been on YouTube um, since the second week. And just yesterday was the first time I was able to join on Zoom. And it's, um, it's been truly beautiful. I've, uh, I've joined with my parents. They're actually on the in the other room on YouTube. They're both doctors, so it's been um, beautiful for them to practice whenever wow. they are able to. Um, and I just want to say, um, before I ask my question, I want to say thank you so much, uh, John Bashu, Soren, Dr. Kabatson. Um, it's been truly grateful. I want to thank the entire community because it's been so inspiring for me um, to see everyone's deep love, um, courage tenacity, strength, and just the way um, in which you practice and, and live life. It's been very inspiring and it, I've learned so much from all of you. So thank you very much. 
And um, Dr. Kevinson, I want to say thank you. You can you call so me much. John. Okay, John. Sorry. Thank you. Um, John, thank you so much because um, I, found, I, I found your book, um, Mindfulness for Beginners in College, and um, it really changed my life. And I was lucky enough to be able to practice MBSR um, online at the CFM at UMass. And it was also very, very um, life-changing for me. And I, uh, I feel like a true beginner. I learn more each, like every day. Um, so I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for all of your work because um, it, it has truly changed my life. Thank you very much. Well, you couldn't say a nicer thing to me. So thank you. That's really beautiful <laughs> that it's touched you in that way. It has. It really has. Where um, are you calling from, by the way? I'm calling from Bogota, Colombia. Okay. Uh, yeah. No. Say hi um, to your parents for all of us. Yeah, hi, parents. They're yeah. watching. <laughs> They're Thousands watching. Yeah. Of hellos. Hi there, parents. <laughs> um, my question is uh, regarding anxiety and avoidance. Um, since I started practicing mindfulness, I've noticed uh, a big change with regards to my relating to anxiety and the aversion I feel to towards it. Um, I started experiencing panic, panic attacks when I was uh, 18 and I'm, I'm now 27. So it's been a long journey of healing and mindfulness has been truly liberating in many ways. But um, now I'm dealing with the challenge of, uh, of practicing with regards to certain activities that bring up the anxiety. And I have, uh, like I can sense the feelings in my body. That's what I struggle with the most. So the racing hard or sweaty palms or not feeling like my outer limbs yeah. when it gets really intense. Um, so I, I, I feel afraid of those symptoms. And um, that leads me to avoiding, for example, a situation would be driving and it's by myself because when I'm with someone else, I'm fine, but it's by myself. So for some reason, like, I guess um, I have this like programming, so, so to speak, in my mind or thought where like, if I drive alone, uh, I'm going to be anxious or I'll feel those symptoms. So it's not that I'm afraid of the driving because I love driving, but it's or more- Or that you think you're going to have an accident or you're catastrophizing. No, it's not that. You're not doing that. Okay. No, no. It's, it's more about um, the feeling, the fear of feeling those symptoms and I feel af afraid of feeling them and afraid that I, um, I'm, that's just one situation, maybe others, but that I'm going to embarrass myself in front of people or that I'm going to um, possibly die. Um, it, it may be silly, but that it's not, I, no, I don't, I don't hear it as silly at all. You know, anything that w is causing us suffering, pain and suffering is not silly and really uh, has to be taken seriously. In fact, that's what putting out the welcome mat means. It doesn't mean dismiss it as being silly. It means turning towards it and um, embracing it, welcoming it, so to speak, and, and engaging with it in a way that is deeply interested, you might even say curious about what the hell this is, because it's, it's um, limiting your life in a certain way. But if you do a certain kind of mental Aikido on it, the martial art of Aikido, and you move in close, and you investigate it moment by moment by moment, I've used this analogy before. It's like putting your toe in the in in cold water, you know, and you don't want to jump in, but you just put your little toe in, and then after a while, maybe you can put in your whole foot, and then after a while, so you can actually um, um, acclimatize yourself to these feelings, and begin to look deeply at them and ask yourself, is my awareness of all this fear, and how does the fear manifest? Usually it manifests as thinking, and then it manifests as, you know, feelings in the body. So, but the awareness as we've been practicing with it, it can hold any thought. 
no matter how scary, no matter how wrong, <laughs> no matter how right, they can hold it and see it as a thought. And when you see it as a thought, you've had that experience, I'm sure, many times. It somehow doesn't have the power that it had the moment before when you believed the narrative of it, the content. It's the same for emotion. When, and, and the same for sensation in the body. That's one of the reasons I recommended that book uh, called Physical Intelligence, because a lot of this stuff expresses in like a tightness in the chest or in the jaw or in the band of pressure in the head or whatever it is, or your fists actually clench up. And it can be terrifying. It can feel like I'm being taken over by forces that I don't have any control over. None of that's true. But as soon as that stuff happens, then the thinking and the emotion tend to actually collaborate to sink your ship. But you could actually do Aikido on it and just turn towards it and open to it and welcome it at least with your toe in the water and just see for one half an in-breath or one in-breath, can I be with this anxious feeling? even driving the car. And I feel this, the, this the feelings that are here as the breath comes in. Feel the feelings that are here. And where in the body? Is it my belly? Is it my chest? Is it my jaw? Is it my forehead? Or all of the above? Doesn't matter because you know what? The awareness is not caught in anxiety. It never is. It never was. It never will be. So you already have the degree of freedom. The question is, can you occupy it? Can you inhabit it in a way that, that gives you a new dimension to relate to what is this panic attack kind of feeling or anxiety kind of feeling? As soon as you do that, things start to change. And I mean, we've written scientific papers about the effects of MBSR on people with panic disorder and generalized anxiety and the vast majority of them. It's like, you put the welcome mat out for the next panic attack, okay? And, you know, we'll go as deeply as you feel like, but over days, weeks, months, and hopefully not years, all of a sudden, by befriending it, it no longer has an agenda with you. And you will have developed uh, new ways of being in relationship to those kinds of feelings in the body, those kinds of sensations or th and thoughts in the mind, and the which kind of circumstances trigger it more than others. So when you're driving as opposed to in other conditions, the bottom line is it's all workable. And, it, you know, and there's no special um, kind of specialized application of mindfulness that you need to do. You just keep practicing in exactly the way you are with the kind of suggestions or highlighting that I, that we've had in this conversation. Does that make any you. sense to you? Yes, it does. And I'm, I'm sure you've been doing that already to some degree. Thank you. Have, have you not? Yeah, yes. I, I've tried to practice and I feel like uh, being in this community and this retreat has helped me practice that much more, putting the welcome mat out as you've been emphasizing since the beginning, has truly helped me to, mm -hmm. as you say, start dipping my toe in the water. Yeah, and uh, you know, the prognosis is very, very positive that this should very rapidly become something that uh, once you turn and attend to it, you know, it, you get, it, its message gets through to you. You can ask yourself, you could even write a letter Dear anxiety uh, attack, what is it that you want from me? Then write a letter as the anxiety, you know, dear James, <laughs> this is what I'm trying to get through to you. Why don't you ever really listen? And then, you know, sometimes that's actually a very effective way of bringing mindfulness to the cognitive dimension of what you're experiencing. But again, I would approach it, approach it with a very light and playful touch and don't take it too seriously because the more you take it seriously and build a narrative about how my life is being adversely affected by my fear and anxiety, the more it builds on itself and reinforces. 
And as soon as you see that that's just the thought, so again, it's like touching a soap bubble, it self-liberates in that moment for now. And then you may have to do a lot of touching soap bubbles, but that's what awareness is good at. Thank you very much. Thank you. Be well. Thank you so much. You too. Thank you. All right. We're just going to keep moving through this. Um, I think so. Nora, I believe. Am I pronouncing your name right? Welcome. Let's see. I'm asking you to unmute. And so I believe you're unmuted. Welcome. Unmuted. Thank you. Yes, we can I hear you. Well, it's evening here, so good evening to everyone. Uh, I'm from Kuwait. Oh, wonderful. Um, I have been joining this uh, group for the last uh, couple of days here. Uh, and I started my journey in mindfulness, I'd say, approximately a year ago. Um, it started with questioning different things regarding senses. I was curious about the senses and how do we understand things around us and how can we pay attention to a certain sense and it would completely make a huge difference by enjoying the, enjoying the little things around us that we never notice in our daily life, but mm. when you pay attention to them, you just enjoy it. And then I heard about an MBSR program that was going here in Kuwait, um, and I joined it. Um, and it was a beautiful journey, honestly. Oh, uh, I'm glad to hear that. Just... It, it was beautiful. Um, it, it's just, I started exploring other things. Um, I had a chronic pain and uh, I still have it, but going through mindfulness and like the MBSR program, it helped me kind of understand it more and just, you know, be with it um, and like, so I got attached to the physical aspect of when I meditate, it's always thinking of the positive uh, or like I would say, focusing on the, uh, the physical aspect of it. Where, where is the pain? How is the pain? You know, and just being with it and staying with it, which I struggle now with uh, is the emotional part, which, you know, trying to get to the emotional part when it comes to I know I'm feeling like a lot of feelings and a lot of things, but I don't get I, like I can't. I I don't get to be with them because somehow I just don't understand or can't figure out where they're coming from, and I try to you know just I don't have to know where they're coming from. I don't have to know at the beginning how they are and just be with them, but I I can't even be with them without knowing what are they if it if it makes any sense. Um, it's only that part that I think is like, how can, how can we tap, I tap into that part and like explore it? Because I do feel that I need it in my life because I get to points where, whether at work, whether it's, you know, in different situation of life where I just, I just can't breathe at some point And like, I can't even speak up. Uh, I would get kind of like either, I would call them like some chokes or tears or, that I don't know why I'm having them. Sometimes at work, which really disturbed, disturbed me a lot. Um, I yeah. tried to, yeah, so I just, I don't, and I tried to be with them. I tried to stay with them. And I, like, I just, I don't know how to take, to explore it further. What, is there any readings that you recommend? Is there any kind of thing that you would suggest to focus on during uh, either these parts uh, of, well, of like, yeah, I don't know you well enough to really be able to make two specific recommendations. And I'm not even, you know, familiar with your culture or I've never been to Kuwait. So I, I, I don't know, you know, sort of really what the landscape is enough, but let's inquire a little bit together. I mean, uh, are there particular circumstances where you where this comes up for you? The, the recent one that actually I thought it's, it has been an issue, it was, it was work. Uh, work. Where, yes, uh, where I have, like, I was kind of asking for certain rights and I was like in the middle of some sort of negotiation. And like, 
be, being like going there and asking for things is is just culturally not... challenging, right? Yeah. Well, you you know, I don't know much about your your society at all, but I do know that women around the world have been uh, basically, uh, in some way or other, disregarded for you know centuries. And uh, in this day and age, I think the world is beginning to wake up to the fact that that's a huge uh, injustice. And it has all, it carries all sorts of uh, suffering with it. And it, n none of this is easily kind of like fixed. Do you know what I'm saying? It's not like, oh, well, just meditate and, you know, disregard for your embodied presence or capacity for um, problem solving or whatever it is, judgment, clarity, your, your um, you know, um, uh, your, you know, sort of the positive dimensions of your being that might contribute to the work environment in ways that uh, work needs people to be engaged fully in their work, be imaginative, be creative, take responsibility and stuff like that. But if you feel in some sense that the forms are um, straightjacketing you or constraining you in one way or another, well, let me just ask you, is that part of it? I think it could be somehow. Okay, because you know, I don't know again. So this is really on you, your homework, so to speak, for the next year or two, and there's plenty of time, but to uh, trust your own intuition that maybe there's nothing wrong with you and maybe it's not, you know, sort of like you're trying to hide or escape, but that you're not being seen or felt or heard or recognized for the full spectrum of what you might have to offer to the work setting. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then again, I don't know the culture at all, but the more women become empowered, the more you either change the work setting or you change the job. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? And over mm -hmm. time, the society changes, the culture changes. This is huge though, an enormous source of suffering in my country and in many, many countries. Uh, and the one thing I would say, you know, so is like, trust yourself. Don't sell yourself short. Okay, life is too short to do that. And if you feel that you have a certain way that you want to be related to, want to be respected, want to be able to contribute in the world, and the world is putting barricades and barriers here and there, then... Um, Survey the lay of the land and ask where could the water flow past the obstacles? Mm -hmm. And there are certain kinds of energy and I think feminine embodied intelligence in the form of love certainly fits that metaphor like water flowing down a mountain. If it runs into an obstacle, what does it do? just finds a way around the obstacle. If it runs into 10 obstacles, it finds a thousand different ways around down the mountain. So I, I, I think that's a kind of general principle that you could um, in some sense uh, help yourself to remember so that you don't wind up blaming yourself for barriers and obstacles that are preventing you from mm, uh, flowering in all the different domains of work and responsibility that uh, human beings, all of us want to, adults especially, want to flower, flourish in our lives. I don't know if this is helpful or not because I'm kind of this so, you know, th this kind of way of interacting has its limits in terms of like, you know, trying to compress into a very short time in conversation, something that's deeply, deeply profound. So we both have to work on uh, trusting our intuition in a certain way. Great, appreciate it. Thank you so much. So this do you have any response to what I've just said? More than I think, 
I think the waterfall image that you have mentioned and like the different obstacles and working around them is something that that is very relatable. Like when you have talked about it, I think that's something that I, you know, and that's what I have been doing for the past seven years since I moved back home. Um, and it's, that's how I have been working is if I find one door closed, I would, you know, yeah. go and try to find something else and work around it um, somehow. And I have been um, blessed to get to things w and get to places where I want. It hasn't been like an, an issue, like a Glad complete to issue, hear that. But, but it's that, it's that feeling that, that goes through it, that, you know, uh, you know, <clears throat> It's those doors that you face and like the the pain and the struggle that you you know you reach when you think you're almost there but then you have to yeah. take the detour. So this you know? is a matter of like uh, your sovereignty as a human being really and the, the want, needing we all need to be recognized for the full dimensionality of who and what we are as human beings. Often work settings don't exactly do that they just want uh, somebody to fulfill a certain job, don't ask too many questions, don't cause any trouble, and don't think too much uh, yeah. about what the bigger picture is. So, but this is changing, the world is changing. And in some sense, I'm guessing that you are helping Kuwait society stretch the envelopes uh, in whatever ways that you can. So most important thing is not to take it personally if it's not personal, because that could lead to like, you're feeling badly about yourself instead of just seeing that the society is having to recognize things that for a long time it hasn't recognized. That's as true in the United States in, as it is, you know, I've been talking a lot about social justice, racial justice, all sorts of ways in which our society in the US has held people back, not just personally, but systemically, systematically, and the laws have supported all that. And then when people complain about it, they say, well, it's all your problem. It's not, not our problem. It's just the way it is. It's not the way it is. It's a human constructed, you know, sort of um, um, universe that uh, has only limited v validity and is often based on injustices that need to end. So um, in that sense, let me just say, the practice of mindfulness is totally revolutionary because you're willing to look at the actuality of things starting from scratch and starting from first principles and then don't take personally what's not personal because otherwise like the society will destroy you or your friends even can <laughs> compound the misery because they'll you know sort of but if you if they're really your friends then and you're not taking personally what's not personal then you can have personal satisfaction in working the edge of uh, the unfolding of uh, greater wisdom and compassion and clarity and effective work environments in the world. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, maybe we we'll get a chance to talk in two or three years and you can report back how it's going. You have to come to Kuwait then. <laughs> Thank you. I'd be interested. Maybe another lifetime, though, for me. That's I don't know. <laughs> uh, who's traveling in, anymore nowadays, anyway? Uh -oh. I feel like I'm already in Kuwait, having had this conversation with you. That's more profound in many ways than if I get on an airplane and I go to Kuwait and I do something. This is priceless. And I feel like you've given me and probably everybody listening in an incredible gift by just being willing to raise your hand and and, and talk about something like this with the kind of equanimity and clarity that you voiced it. Appreciate your time and everything. Thank you. That's precious. Thank you. All right, Soren, look at the clock. It's amazing. Sure, yeah. It's like, it's now again. How did this happen? Uh, anything else, John, before we say our goodbyes for today? The only thing I want to say is see you tomorrow. Um, all of you, whether you're on YouTube or whether you're on, uh, on Zoom, that uh, tomorrow is going to be the last session of this mitigation retreat. There will, as I understand it, be another 
one on Tuesday. Is that correct, Soren? Do you want to say something? Uh, yeah, Tuesday, um, Perry and Capucine and Thomas and I will just, or mainly them, will just be talking to you about the map and asking, answering any questions about the book lists or other things that the website is providing. So it'll be, it, there won't be any meditations or anything. It's mainly just a question, Q&A about the website that's been developed and, and the map and, and um, yeah, and what they're so, doing around that. So I actually do have something to say at the right. end, you know, and you never know, but it's what I I'll loop it back to the Diamond Sutra. Develop a mind that clings to nothing, including 13 weeks of being together like this. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been what it has been. It will be whatever it is. So it's not that we can't love it and love everything that's unfolded, but let's not cling to it and turn it into a thing. Because to that degree, we will have a kind of, in some sense, disempowered uh, or uncoupled ourselves from some of the most profound dimensions that we've been cultivating together. And we need all the dimensions that we can get. Okay, so let's not close off anything. This is not an ending of anything tomorrow. It's just a, a new transition into don't know mind. And the ways in which we've touched each other over these past 13 weeks of being together, alone, <laughs> together, um, is really unfathomable. We'll never figure this out, no matter how much longer all of us live. And we don't need to. Plus, we have this amazing gift of the creativity uh, on the part of so many people, but in particular, uh, Perry and Tomas and and Capucine in offering this um, these various platforms that might actually you know be wormholes or portholes into a new universe. So I'm all for that. And as far as I know, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm just trying to be where I already am, mm -hmm. and uh, that's you know quite an undertaking and it's a love affair you know moment by moment by moment okay so you can now uh if you want to go into gallery view you can unmute yourself and say any uh words of goodbye or blessings bless you john thank you thank you john Thank you so much, 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 Thank you Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.